ladies and gentlemen. Uh, great pleasure for me to be with you this early morning. Um, what I would like to do is uh, give you a little bit of an impression of uh, how digitalization plays a role in space. Now, you might think that um, having seen, and I'm pretty sure many of you have seen uh, science fiction movies, very recent ones, there we see all these fantastic technologies, and uh, you might think that it is exactly the same on the International Space Station. We are not yet there. Indeed, uh, there is quite a lot of domains where we can benefit from this current development, and for that I would like to give you a little bit of introduction how work and life is on board the International Space Station. Alexander Gerst, I hope you all know him and following his uh, work that he's doing, is experiencing this environment at the moment um, until December. And uh, let me first introduce you a little bit to the International Space Station. Uh, later on, I will expand a little bit below low Earth orbit. Obviously, we would like to go uh, to further distances from Earth, hopefully back to the moon in the next decade, and in the following decade, then maybe to Mars. And I'm sure you all agree that uh, digital technologies play quite a crucial role there. Just some background info. On the International Space Station, it's really international. 15 member states build it. More than 100 um, states on this planet are participating in the research. We have an overseeable share of 8.3% on this overall task. USA, Russia, Canada, Japan, and Europe is participating. Since the December 2000, we have a permanent crew up there. Initially, it started with three persons. Then you might remember this uh, um, terrible accident in 2003 with the shuttle Columbia. Then uh, the crew members went down to two persons for logistical reasons. And 2006, when I got on board, then crew members were again up to three. And since 2011, six persons are working up there. At the moment, there are six astronauts. Um, doing their work, and actually we are looking forward for Alexander to take over his function as ISS commander. It will be the second um, European commander ever, and uh, the first German, so we are very proud of that. This huge infrastructure is currently planned to be operated till 2024. It doesn't mean that it falls apart at the 1st of January 25. Um, but um, we need a decision, a political decision, of course, to use this infrastructure for beyond. Technically, it would be good to be operated at least till 2028 or even beyond. But so far, uh, let's say the political consent is only for this time. So with this, um, let's say, overall programmatic uh, overview, let me give you a little bit insight into the overall dimensions of this very unique uh, living place. What you see here has about the size of a football field. Uh, in horizontal direction, uh, it extends about 108 meters, vertically more than 70 meters. Here on this top right side, you see the European Columbus module. This is a research facility in which we do a lot of different research topics about which I will talk a little bit later because I think it's interesting that you understand under which conditions the astronauts are living and working on there. Uh, by the way, not only living, but really surviving. I mean, all these technical systems help them to withstand this uh, very um, unfriendly environment of high vacuum, extreme temperatures. The station needs supply still from Earth, uh, from uh, supply spaceships. Just last weekend, a Japanese supply spaceship was launched and docked to the station. Here you see a European supply spaceship, uh, the ATV, which uh, we sent up to the station about five times uh, during um, the uh, existence. And um, here, of course, uh, this is uh, a huge volume as compared to earlier times in 95, 96 on was on the Russian space station here, things were much closer. The internal volume is about 400 cubic meters. That is comparable with the interior of a Jumbo jet. So for six persons, quite OK. But I can tell you, if you're up there for half a year, um, at the end, it feels quite tight. Now, before I go into specifically the work that we are doing in orbit, let me explain a little bit how this command and control structure work. In general, we distinguish between the space segment, be it the space station or the satellites that are orbiting the Earth or in the depths of space, and the so-called ground segment. 
Here, um, these uh, space segments have very specific tasks. In case of the ISS, it's doing the research. And then, of course, we need to exchange data. We need to control the onboard system that everything is working. And that we do in various ways. Either we use a geostationary data rely satellite, which allows a pretty high data rate, uh, about uh, 200 megabit per second, and then uh, send it down to ground station, or we can directly send data when we are over flying ground stations down. So obviously one important aspect of this whole working scenario is the bandwidth which, with which you can exchange information, data, telemetry with ground. Now on ground this data is collected in one control center, it's in the US, and then distributed to other control centers over the world. Um, obviously, for each of the various segments, you have control centers in Moscow, in Germany, in the, the south, close to Munich, Oberpfaffenhofen, controlling the Columbus module, uh, in Japan for the Japanese module, and for Canada for a robotic system that you can see here. And then for all the scientific work that is done up there, we have so-called user support centers. So we have a kind of... Um, um, loggers, which are dedicated for specific research, material science, uh, human uh, research, uh, fluid science, and so forth. And each of these loggers are controlled by one of these user support centers. So I hope that gives you a very rough idea how this overall infrastructure is connected to each other and um, how important it is this data change during the normal work. Now these control centers are, and the ground stations are distributed over the planet as the Earth is turning in 24 hours. Of course, we need to be sure that we have always contact to one of them. You see these uh, dots with uh, different colors. Over there we have uh, antennas like those. These are three deep space antennas of uh, the European Space Agencies. They are located about 120 degrees apart on the globe. So while the Earth is turning that each one of those has view of our various satellites or other objects that are in space. So that gives you already impression of the infrastructure that is needed. And obviously, and let me point that out here, bandwidth, the amount of data we can exchange in real time is obviously already a critical issue. Now on the ground, you see a view in the control centers. Um, here people are watching 24 seven over all the onboard systems. There is a variety, a high variety of systems that are necessary in order to operate a satellite or a space station. You need power, electrical power, you need thermal control, you need guidance navigation and control to maintain the attitude, telecommunication systems and so forth. All this needs to be checked. There is some level of automation, but not yet, um, let's say, to an extent that you could miss out all these specialists on the ground who are watching over these systems. And I think you can already get a feeling if you just look at this um, scenario here. You see people sitting in front of multiple of uh, screens with uh, um, all kinds of display, engineering display, showing data from all different onboard systems. You can already get an imagination that you know, there is really space for improvement in applying new technologies in order to um, have this control of all these onboard systems a little bit more um, efficiently. Now let me go back to the space segment. What is the generic task of the crew? You often hear the astronauts talking about the beautiful view um, of the Earth, which is certainly amazing, but unfortunately most of the time they have to work uh, to do the science. About 70% of the working time is dedicated to science. Then uh, another not unimportant task is to just operate the systems. I mean, uh, back home, uh, you cannot just uh, sit in your uh, apartment or your home and uh, hope that everything is working every once in a while. Some maintenance is needed for the uh, central heating for whatever machine you have for your computer network, and the same is the case on ISS. The astronauts cannot just call a technician from ground to come up and help them solving it. They have to do it themselves. So they need to operate these systems, they need to do maintenance, and of course sometimes they have to do repair and replace. So this we can say are the generic tasks up there, and I'm sure you understand that with these new kind of technologies that digitization can bring, 
um, we can imagine a lot of uh, improvements in terms of efficiency in order to maximize the scientific output for all the scientific teams on ground. Now let, you, let me give you an overview of the scientific work that the astronauts are doing. It's a wide spectrum of various tasks, and there is not a single scientist who is really a specialist in all these various areas. So the astronauts, who have all a professional background in maybe geology, as Alexander Gerst at the moment, I'm a, an aerospace engineer and military pilot, uh, there are colleagues who come from the medical area, they all need to be trained to cover all this wide spectrum of areas. So already in the training, you are looking for ways to optimize the training to get the maximum of knowledge in an um, overseeable time into the heads of those um, astronauts who then need to go up into space and perform these tasks on behalf of the scientific teams on the ground. On the right side, you see uh, the Columbus module. This is one of the modules docked to the International Space Station where now um, a lot of this scientific work is done. And here you get a very rough overview, some impressions of the daily work um, that is performed. I'm not going to explain all of them to you, but it just gives you a little insight. For example, here, material science, physics, medical experiments. We are looking more and more for commercial utilization, where we are inviting companies to do their uh, proprietary research on board. And one thing I would like to point out, because this is really a first, you see here a little football-sized device, which is called Simon. And this is the first time that we are executing an experiment with artificial intelligence on board ISS. Alexander will start with this experiment in a short time. Um, it is already on board the space station, and this little companion is supposed to support Alexander in the task that I just explained you. While he's performing science, while he's doing operating systems, uh, checking systems, or even doing repair work. It's the first test, of course, we need to further develop this kind of support, and that goes a little bit already in the direction of, uh, let's say, the science uh, fiction scenarios that uh, you might have seen where uh, the astronauts are just interfacing with voice uh, to the uh, computer system. The computer system gives them all smart answers if problems arise in order to solve them. We are not there yet, but um, it's certainly one important area of development. Just to give you an idea of the different um, work that is done up there, you see here from all the international partners, all the more than 100 countries, most of the scientific work is in the field of biology, biotechnology, um, biochemistry, um, physical sciences, um, like uh, here the, the light blue is physics, um, you see here human research, uh, quite a lot for educational tasks. All astronauts are performing some little experiments for schools, for universities, um, in order to convey a little bit the specifics of weightlessness. And here you see specifically in ESA, so we put quite a lot of emphasis on education and the other areas like human research, physics, technology, and biology are um, almost evenly distributed. Now, having said that, um, just a glance on board the station, here you see quite an actual uh, view of the environment here. Um, you see Alexander with his colleague uh, from NASA um, during a normal working day. The background, a very, very technical environment, and I think you can uh, easily imagine how much you really depend on uh, digital devices. And I will come to that moment uh, in, a, in a moment a little bit more in detail. Here, Alexander, while he's performing a scientific experiment, physiological experiment, which is looking in the interaction between machines and the, the perception um, of human being. Um, one word for the international character, I already mentioned it before, 103 countries are working together, and um, I think this is really um, something to point out. Uh, they are all pursuing a common goals for really all humanity, and that is why I um, introduced this slide um, to show it to you. There are indeed areas where humans quite on a large scale, are working together and uh, not just following their own interests. Now, let me come back to the typical working scenario on board the station. Here, 
uh, you can see a, a, a glance on a situation when I was uh, on board ISS. You have basically three networks on board the station. One network is uh, built to operate the station systems, to control them, to uh, check the telemetry. A second network, and that uh, uh, laptop you see on top is linked to it, to control uh, the respective scientific work. So with this laptop, um, I would control uh, the functions of this device here in the back, and then below, you have a third network, which is called Opslan. It's just a, comparable to normal um, home network, where you call up the procedures that you have to execute um, in order to perform this experiment. And you can say this scenario you see here in an example is very generic on station, because independent, if you do a maintenance work, if you do repair work, it's always a similar situation. You have one device hopefully a computer, sometimes it's still written on paper where procedure is written, where you can see the construction plans of a device, then you have an interface to give commands, and of course sometimes when you do, uh, for example, replace and repair, you need the classical tools, a wrench, a screwdriver, and things like that. And here um, another problem comes uh, into play. You know, weightlessness is a fantastic feeling. Floating around, you know, using all three dimensions is great. But I tell you, if you have to do mechanical work, you are always missing at least one additional leg and at least one additional arm. Because the forces you need to apply with wrenches and so forth, you need to, to counteract in some way. So um, even though it's easy to move this uh, pump, uh, system that uh, you see here, it's uh, more than 25 kilograms, you can move that with two fingers, but when you start working with wrenches, you always need to ha hold on with one hand, with one leg, and then with the other hand you can walk. And then you have a procedure to follow, and uh, you could see before there is a, uh, still a paper procedure that I clip on board, and I think it's very easy <laughs> to imagine how new technologies like augmented reality could help in such a situation to do the work very easily because uh, you could even use a fourth arm to hold your procedure right in front while you are with the other two hands uh, trying to manipulate that. Every once in a while, systems fail. Let me ask you, does uh, anybody still know the famous movie Arthur C. Clarke 2001? Space Odyssey? Ah, very few. Uh, you might recall this uh, very interesting exchange that the crew has with the famous Hell 9000 computer, who finally uh, de determines or decides that the crew is a threat and kills them all. Um, of course, uh, unfortunately, we are not at this point yet. But of course, we would wish to have support on board the station to give us an indication when onboard systems need to be replaced. You don't want to wait until a system fails. And that's why I show you this system. This is an electrolysis system that was installed by my uh, colleague, Sergei Krikaljev, um, just half a year before I got on the station. Um, it produces oxygen, so not unimportant when you want to live up there because you need oxygen for breathing. And um, this little device here in front, you see, that um, I wouldn't say exploded, it was a deflagration, completely unexpected. Of course, you don't want that to happen. Ideally, you want to have a system that gives you an indication that you better exchange this thing before something like that happens. There are many other examples when the station was built up in the first year, you can say, when all these various systems I were talking about were working together, this is not... Um, Let's say it's not always very deterministic. So you have a little error in deep in the system, and you get very strange indications that not always lead to this one error, which is really the cause of the problem. So it's not strongly, not strongly deterministic, but fortunately yet we have a huge group of people on board who are following that round the clock seven days a week and could help the crew to solve the problems. Of course, this is an area where I see big applications of artificial intelligence in future to help the crew analyzing the system and, of course, help us to get further into space. And I don't want to uh, get too much into detail going outside of the station during extravehicular activity, 
um, you cannot hold a procedure in, in, in your hand. You need your hands to grab to the station to, to work with the tools. So also here, um, kind of augmented reality could be just fantastic, help you to do the work outside, but in case there is a problem, one of my colleagues had a problem with his suit. He almost uh, drowned inside his spacesuit because the cooling loop had a leak to give the right steps to take um, and to save life. So a very vast area for applications. Now, of course, uh, I was talking now about the situation in space on board the International Space Station, but as I said before, there is a moment when we want to move out again. Go back to the moon um, in the next decade, maybe in the 30s, uh, send humans to Mars, and until we get there, there are a lot of technologies that still need to be refined, further developed, um, and we and other space agencies are working on that. Now, what is the one area that links it all together, and that is obviously artificial intelligence and um, augmented reality or virtual reality? As I was just trying to explain to you, in this environment, you rely very much on a very good and smart link between all these various systems that you need to find your destination, to work all the systems, to have life support systems working, to produce all the science data that you want to have in the most efficient way. And with this introduction, let's take a quick glance to the next destinations. One of them, of course, being the moon. Why is the moon so interesting? Next year, we will celebrate 50 years of the first moon landing. Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, it's still incredibly interesting. For scientists, it's a history book of our own planet. It's uh, very likely that there are very interesting resources, water, rare metals, and others, and it could be a fantastic stepping stone to reach other destinations like Mars or even beyond. So what are we now doing um, in the European Space Agency together with our partners in the US, in Russia, in Japan, in um, Canada, and hopefully further um, agencies that will join. We are currently developing a propulsion module for uh, the US Orion capsule, which will launch first time in the year 2020, initially unmanned, and then it will um, launch uh, a year later with a crew flying around the moon. Then um, in the first half of the next decade, such an intermediate station between Earth and Moon will be built up where ESA is looking into the contribution of such uh, elements like a habitation module based on our experience we had with, um, with um, um, Columbus and a refueling and docking um, uh, uh, module. So you see a lot of advanced technologies are entering in this domain. Also with our Russian partners, the robotic system. So robotics play an important role in the exploration that will land on the south pole of uh, the moon to analyze the ground and to see if we can find water and use it for the generation of oxygen and um, for um, uh, drinking water and so forth. And with that, let me quickly um, finish with uh, very course points which uh, we think are really suitable for enhancing our capabilities and helping us in achieving the goals that I was just mentioning. Obviously, significant improvement of human-machine interfaces is one of the key areas, and I think this is very closely linked to digitalization and optimization of human-robotic interaction. Today, robots are already quite amazing what they can do, but there is space for improvement. Uh, just recently seen this famous movie, iRobot, is still a long way to go. So closing the link between sensors and the actuators with um, intelligence is a big challenge here. I already mentioned the optimization of the interaction between systems to clearly have an idea what is going on in very complex, um, diverse systems to help the crew to understand problems before they happen, take um, action, and then, of course, guidance, navigation, and control to maintain your right track to your destination, to maintain the um, orientation of the space station. So this gives you an idea how important um, this area of digitalization and all the related technologies, virtual reality, augmented reality, speech recognition, and AI are for us. 
Thank you very much for your attention and um, see you later then on a panel.